one thing I did want to mention was uh, we do ask that everyone keep their microphone and video off uh, just so that we can eliminate any uh, noise or anything like that and to help us save bandwidth. Uh, we will be turning our videos on and off as we present uh, as long as the internet allows for that. So we will be using the chat box to interact. If you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat as we go along. We'll be uh, checking that from time to time. If I'm presenting, then Sherry will be checking the chat. And if she is presenting, then I'll be checking the chat. So that's a great way to get your questions answered right away or we'll try our best. Or you can wait till the end of the, the session and, and answer your question at that time. So with that, let's get started. Oh, I could do and then getting back to the uh, the beginning slide. I just want to do a sound check. Can you hear me okay, Ashley? Yep, sounds good. Okay, very good. Thank you. So while Sherry is getting us back to uh, the beginning, I did want to do a quick introduction. My name is Ashley Bodkins and I work for the University of Maryland Extension Office in Garrett County. And my co-host this evening is Miss Sherry Frick, uh, and she is the Ag Agent and Master Gardener Coordinator for Allegheny County. So this is probably our fifth or sixth class that we've done in this series of gardening online trainings. And we are so happy that you guys have joined us this evening uh, to learn a little bit about managing pests and diseases in your vegetable garden. So we're going to be talking about something called integrated pest management and if you guys have any experience with this topic again please feel free to enter your your stories in the chat or interact with us however you're comfortable with but we'll be talking about some of our trials and tribulations on this subject and we hope that we have a really uh, informative session for you all You having problems taking control of the screen? I seem to be. <laughs> I don't know why we practiced this. Yeah, I know. I don't know why it doesn't ever want to cooperate. So you just go ahead and uh, I'll forward it. Okay. I think this is where you're going to take over for the next few and then I will pick back up. Oh, okay. Very good. So I will get started here then. So um, we're so glad that you joined us today. And uh, today what we're gonna talk about is what factors um, are included in integrated pest management. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before. Sometimes we refer to it as IPM. So if we say that, that's, that's what IPM stands for is integrated pest management. And it's a, um, a way to um, prevent pests, garden pests and diseases from getting a hold in your garden. It's a way to use many different techniques to, to manage uh, pests and diseases. Um, we're also gonna talk about benefits and risk of, of using pesticides. And basically what we wanna do is give you a whole lot of tools in order to be able to control um, disease issues and pest issues and not just rely on maybe maybe you rely on pesticides. Well, we'd like to help you figure out other ways to do this so that you can lessen your uh, use of pesticides in your own landscapes. Um, and we're going to talk about um, some uh, very um, common diseases that you will see in your vegetable garden and how to uh, help prevent them and how to control them. And then we're gonna talk about some insects that you may see in your garden and help you to be able to distinguish between beneficial insects and those uh, that can cause you problems. And then we're gonna talk about some ways to help um, control insect problems in your vegetable garden. So that's the overview for what we're gonna to do today. And I'm having problems. Can you forward, Ashley? So we have, seem to have a bit of a lag from where we can move. I can, I cannot. I'm gonna give you back control. How about that? Okay, all right. See if that helps, see if that helps. Yep, there we go. All right. 
Okay, so Ashley, am I, I'm doing this one, right? Okay, so there are different kinds of pests that you're going to encounter. And uh, it could be weeds or it could be insects. It could be disease causing organisms such as fungi, bacteria, viruses, or it could be wildlife. So we're not gonna focus too much on wildlife today, but I'm sure you all struggle with deer in your landscapes. But uh, we're gonna have a, a question time at the end. So if you have you know, specific questions about uh, av birds or mammal problems in your yard, we can help you with that too. So what are your options with control me methods? There's just not one single uh, solution in pest management. So in, in most cases, many methods can be used to manage a pest population. You could use um, pesticides, you could use sanitation where you would clean up your all your plant debris at the end of the growing season. That would be a form of cultural control. You can use barriers and traps and we're going to um, delve into all those different ways of being able to control pests. So what are some of the benefits of using pesticides? Well they are relatively low cost um, especially, say, say you have a, um, a termite, termite problem, you know, the damage that termites could cause to your home far outweighs the cost of hiring somebody to come and spray or put down some kind of pesticide to kill the uh, termites. And the same thing with, you know, protecting a tree against some kind of disease, the cost of that um, fungicide it is you know, very minimal compared to the cost of having to hire somebody to come in and remove a tree. So you know, pesticides are relatively low cost, especially for homeowners. Um, and they're generally very effective when, when used properly. And we always emphasize that the label is the law and please be sure to completely read the label before you begin to use a pesticide and follow all of the instructions. And pesticides generally tend to work quickly. Uh, so if you're trying to protect, protect your fruits or vegetable or your landscape plants, they, a lot of time, when you're talking about insects especially, they can really uh, arrest a problem. And this could be very important to someone who, especially somebody who has a, uh, a big garden and they like to can, and they depend on those, uh, those canned products in the winter time, well, you need to protect your plants so that you can get a harvest. And the same holds true for commercial growers. Um, their livelihood is at stake. So it, you know, the use of pesticides is, um, has a very important role and, it, and it's effective and it can be, um, you know, reduced risk when you're following the, the label according, you know, according to what's on there. So, you also can use uh, pesticides, as I mentioned, to protect structures, which is very important, and also to protect human and pets from diseases that can be transmitted by uh, like fleas or ticks, those kinds of things. Um, if you use flea medications on your pets, you're actually applying a pesticide to them. So you know, there are a lot of benefits to using pesticides. Now, what are some of the risks? Well, some of the risks, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, are there are human health hazards associated with using pesticides, and that's gonna vary with the pesticide that you're using. Some are more hazardous than others, and the label on the pesticide will give you um, words that will help you recognize how dangerous is it, it is, like the lowest risk, we, it would say caution, medium risk would be danger, or excuse me, warning, and then if it's, you know, it's, it can be harmful to your health, it's going to say danger, you know, try and get your attention. So we do know that um, pesticides can be hazardous to our health. That's why it's important to protect ourselves and read that label and find out you know, what protective, personal protective equipment we should have on when handling the pesticide. Another risk of pesticide use is that uh, you can get resistance that develops within the particular pest that you're trying to control. And this usually happens when you use the same pesticide over and over and over. So what happens is 
you, you're able to kill those susceptible pests, but the ones that are genetically different and are able to survive that pesticide application, those are the ones that live and are able then to reproduce. And what do they produce? They produce more like themselves that are able to resist that particular pesticide. So that's why it's important to um, use more than one kind of pesticide in your, your pesticide program. And they should have different, the pesticide you have should have different modes of action. So that term means that the chemical, the active ingredients in that pesticide work through different biological pathways in order to control a partic the particular pest that you're trying to control. So mix up your fungicides and your insecticides and don't use the same one all the time so you can avoid getting um, resistance developing within pest populations. Another problem that can arise with the use of pesticides are secondary pest outbreaks. And usually you see this happen when you use a broad spectrum pesticide one that kills everything, you know, something like seven. So it, it's like an indiscriminate killer, okay? It kills bees, it kills the bad bugs, it kills beneficial insects, it, it kills, you know, your passing by bugs that got nothing to do with anything. They're just, you know, they just are. They're just part of the, the environment. So when that happens, I mean, you have to consider in, you know, in the environment, we talk about food webs and food chains, and it's a story of who eats who. Well, everything is so intricately woven together, but when you start messing with one, one link, link in the food chain, it's gonna have uh, repercussions down the line. So say I used a um, broad spectrum pesticide and it killed uh, a whole bunch of different insects. And one of the insects it killed was, wasn't the target insect, wasn't the bad one, but it happened to be one that was actually feeding on another kind of insect and keeping it under control. Well, now that I have removed the predator of that other pest insect, now that other pest insect can, you know, be free to multiply. And so you can get secondary pest outbreaks. Uh, another risk with pesticide use, uh, I'm sure you've heard a lot about, are the effects on pollinators, especially uh, our native bees and butterflies. So we need to be very careful about how we use pesticides. And when you go to use your pesticides, make sure you read the label, look for a bee warning. And it's usually under environmental hazards. And it will tell you whether or not the product that you're using kills bees. And if it does, then it will tell you that you are not, you may not use that product while a plant is in bloom because that's when the bee would be visiting your plant and would then get that pesticide on them. So um, another thing to consider is with pollinators, powders, grant, uh, powders actually tend to be more detrimental to bees than other forms of pesticides. And of course, anytime you directly spray a bee uh, with a pesticide, that's gonna kill them. So, um, all right, and also the other risk with using pesticides is uh, the possibility of environmental pollution. And that's why we like to do classes like this so that we can help people find other ways to help control pests in their landscapes and stop relying as heavily on uh, pesticides. So our goal is to help you reduce the amount of pesticides you use in your landscape and also maybe give you some uh, reduced risk uh, pesticide options that you, maybe you weren't aware of that can help keep your problems under control as well. Okay, so the impact of pesticide use um, is that if, if you use, uh, use it improperly, you use more than you're supposed to, you, um, you may possibly or you dispose of it incorrectly, you can pollute the air, the water, the soil, and it can have lasting effects. Uh, and impacts on plants and animals and you know on up the food chain to humans. So we really need to be careful about how we use pesticides. All right, Ashley, are you ready to jump in? Sure. I'm gonna give so, you control of the screen. See if you can you move the mouse. Okay. Sure, 
So as Sherry was saying, uh, the whole point of pesticide use is not that we want to tell people that they absolutely cannot use pesticides, but it's more that that should be the last result or the last option after you've tried several other, other things. So we're going to talk about this process of integrated pest management or IPM, where you use several different tactics to control a problem before you actually reach for the, the maybe the easiest version of, of using a pesticide. So I can read this. Uh, the definition of IPM is the integration of various management strategies, including biological, cultural, and chemical methods into a comprehensive program of pest control for the home landscape. And that comes from the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. So just like we've talked about in the past, um, everything is connected in our garden. So as Sherry was saying earlier, um, you know, what you do on a local level here in your landscape, it can have effects on further on up the, the food chain. So we want to eliminate those negative effects as much as possible. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what does integrated mean? Um, so that's, again, the many different strategies that you have uh, in order to control a pest or a problem in your landscape. The pest is going to really be trying to do a lot of research on your end to figure out what is going on. You know, sometimes as gardeners, we tend to point our finger really quickly. So, you know, you may see that there are holes chewed in your leaf and you find... I don't know, a lightning bug on there and you think, oh, that lightning bug had to have caused this damage because that's what critter you saw. But in reality, it could have been slugs that did the damage and the lightning bug was just there hanging out when you happened to walk by. So being able to identify what the real problem is, uh, do a little bit of research there before you just um, automatically assume something is really important. And then management is, again, it's the way that you use the knowledge that you've gained over the years and from past gardening experiences uh, to really figure out what your decisions are or what your options are and then make the best decision for that particular situation. And everyone's situation is going to be a little bit different. So, you know, maybe you have a very high tolerance for some pest problems and maybe you have a very low tolerance for other pest problems or some pest problems on certain plants may, you know, trigger you to want to act a little bit quicker than if they were on something else. So we're going to um, delve into this a little bit further. And Sherry, I cannot advance. Oh, okay. All righty, there we go. Okay. Thank you. So the major principles of integrated pest management is that you as a gardener, you have to figure out what is your tolerable level. So probably everyone on this call has a certain plant that they absolutely love in their landscape. And tonight we're talking specifically about vegetable gardening. Um, Sherry and I have done a couple classes already about tomatoes. You know, we get a lot of questions about tomatoes and that seems to be people's um, you know, one of the crops that they really want to thrive in their vegetable garden. Uh, but maybe for you, it's cucumbers. Whatever that is, whatever that favorite plant is, you might have a little less tolerance for, for pests or diseases on that plant. Whereas there's other things that maybe you don't care as much about. So again, every person is going to have a different tolerance level. And the main thing that we want to stress here is that some pests, particularly you know, some insect pests are going to have to be present in small numbers. Um, we can't eliminate every single insect pest in our garden or every single insect in general uh, and that be something that's actually doable. So you have to figure out, you know, if how many, you know, how many insect pests you can allow uh, because if you, if you don't allow any at all, then you're also never going to have any of the beneficial insects that are going to feed on them. So I use the example of, you know, people that uh, maybe plant dill, uh, you know, the, the herb dill. Uh, sometimes you get a lot of butterfly larvae, uh, the swallowtail butterfly that will lay their egg on the dill. And then once the, that egg hatches out, it turns into caterpillars. 
that really love to consume a lot of dill. So you don't necessarily want to control that pest because if you do, then you're never gonna get any of those swallowtail butterflies visiting your garden. Uh, so you have to really think long and hard about, you know, what is the lasting effect and if I wipe out every single insect pest that I see. All right, can we go to the next slide? Okay, trying. So the first step uh, that you wanna work on is uh, monitoring your landscape. Uh, so this may seem a little bit silly to some people, but again, as gardeners, uh, we tend to remember things maybe worse than they really were, or maybe we don't remember things quite exactly the way we thought it would. Uh, so, uh, you know, by writing things down, that can really make a big difference uh, from year to year. Uh, and again, we tend to sometimes think the worst case sometimes with our plants. And in all reality, our plants can be fairly hardy. They can take a good bit of, of insect and pest pressure, um, especially if they're growing in the right location. So they have the right amount of sun, they get the right amount of water, and they have a good amount of nutrients. Uh, they can take some pressure. So we encourage you to, to try to maintain some sort of plant journal from year to year, uh, just to kind of note where you had problems. So maybe you have a plant growing in, in the wrong place in the landscape. Therefore, it makes it more stressed and more likely to, to succumb to either pest pressure or plant diseases. Uh, so maybe if you would potentially move that plant in another season, you would see some benefits. So the plant would be healthier, it would thrive, it would be able to fight off more of those pests and pest pressure. So some ideas of what things to maintain a record of would be what varieties of plants you had, especially in your vegetable garden last year that did really well, that you really enjoyed. Uh, what were some pests that you found every single time you went out to your garden? Did you see what dates did you start to see the insects, diseases, and weeds show up? And then how did the damage progress as the season went on? So we're gonna talk about some of these things later, uh, but last year I had an infestation of aphids in my high tunnel on um, cantaloupe. And as much as I really wanted to, to kill the aphids, um, within a couple of, I don't know, probably 10 days, I started to see the ladybird beetles showing up. And I also started to see the searfid flies, which are both natural predators of aphids. So even though I had to deal with aphid damage on my cantaloupe, I just couldn't make myself control the aphids because I knew it would harm the beneficial insects that were coming in to kind of take control of it. And they actually did kind of level out um, and we didn't end up losing everything uh, because the natural enemies uh, took over and helped us uh, through the growing season. All right, let's go to number two, Sherry. I'm trying, we've got a little lag here. Okay, so again, I mentioned this a little bit already, but learning what the pest is and what its life cycle is, is really super important too. Uh, you know, it used to be, you know, 30 years ago, if anybody, you know, maybe remembers this, a lot of people knew one pesticide or one insecticide specifically, and that was probably seven. Uh, and it didn't really matter what problem you were having or what insect problem you were having, people just went for the seven dust. Um, and that's because it had such a broad range of control for, you know, seven different families of insects. So, you know, that's that's exactly what we don't want to see people doing is just going for a broad spectrum control strategy. We want it to be as specific as possible to that pest or that disease. Um, and learning about the insect life cycle particularly uh, can be very helpful with helping you to have to use either less pesticide or less, um, you know, less harmful means. So if you can control an insect when it's in its egg stage, that's way easier than if you wait until it's an adult or till it's actually reproducing. 
And the same thing is true with plant diseases. If you can do good sanitation in your garden uh, and, and eliminate any of the spores or the disease causing agent that could overwinter in your garden, that's a step up for the next season. Uh, you're not going to have to worry about there being any inoculum even there. Uh, so that's a great thing to do. All right, next slide. All right, this is number three, and this is a, a major principle with integrated pest management, and it is defining your pest threshold. So again, this is gonna be different for every single person that's on this call tonight. Uh, my threshold is way different than Sherry's, I'm sure. Uh, and it again, it's gonna differ from plant to plant. Uh, so you see in the first picture on the top right, that is Eastern tent caterpillar. Uh, and this is one that we see in the spring of the year, well, midsummer, around now they start to show up. And they actually serve as a great food source for a lot of birds. But if that's in your favorite shade tree, uh, that's really not something that you want to maybe see, especially not when people, you know, drive up to your house. Uh, so you have to really consider, you know, what what is it that you don't like about that? You know, it's gonna cause damage to your trees. If it's a healthy established tree, there's probably not gonna be enough damage to actually kill the tree or cause it harm uh, long-term, especially if it's early in the season. So what matters to you? What is tolerable to you? Again, the bottom picture there um, is of wild garlic. So some people would call that wild onions. Uh, so it's very, uh, unsightly, you know, if you would like to see a nice green, you know, lush lawn or, or grass. Uh, so, you know, what, what can you handle? What do you like? What do you not like? It can be economically or aesthetically based. So for me, I have um, a high tunnel that I grow a lot of fresh vegetables in and my economic threshold is probably going to be way different than just a, a traditional home gardener. I have about 120 tomato plants, I have 150 cauliflower and broccoli plants in there. So I have to be a little more careful on what I allow to get started because with that many plants, it could, you know, potentially explode a whole lot quicker than if you just had two or three in your vegetable garden that you could monitor a little bit closely, closer. All right, let's go on to four. Okay, so Again, this is just a nice chart to uh, sum up what, what are your different options when we talk about integrated pest management. So the first one would be biological control. So this is kind of like what mother nature is gonna help you with. We have physical control. Uh, we're gonna talk about some of those options, things like physically excluding a pest uh, from your plants, like with floating row cover. Chemical control, again, that would be uh, things like your pesticides and maybe it's a very low impact uh, pesticide that you would use and then cultural control either so how are you going to manage your garden more carefully uh, to eliminate pests and pest problems so all of these different options are the different baskets that you pull from to create your integrated pest management plan for your garden all right, let's go on Okay, so the first integrated pest management control option that you have is cultural. So what does this mean? Uh, so this means that you are going to alter the environment to make it less habitable for the pest. Okay, again, this is a good example for plant diseases. So by cleaning up at the end of the season, uh, that's a great way to prevent the inoculum from being there for future growing seasons. Uh, again, if you can, you know, alter the times that you till. So if you uh, maybe till really early in the season, if you have a guard, a vegetable garden, uh, you can kill a lot of those small weeds that are starting to germinate. Uh, and if you till early, let it set for a couple weeks and then till again, uh, we call that creating like a seed, a stale seed bed where you just keep stirring the soil at a very low, um, at a very low level. So just, you know, maybe three or four inches deep. And if you do that a couple times, eventually you'll exhaust all those seeds that are in weed seeds that are in that top couple inches of soil. So this is kind of like a management 
um, option for for controlling weeds. You can also do this with with insect pests. So if you can again till at a different time of year that maybe you wouldn't normally, sometimes you can expose cocoons and pupas of resting you know, the resting stage of some of these insect pests, um, then you, ex when you till them to the top, it's either going to kill them from exposure to the heat or maybe, you know, birds or scavengers like that could, could come in and eat them. Let's go to the next slide, Sherry. I think there's some other um, options on there, examples. So how you can put this cultural control to use, you can rotate your plants and crops. So if you have a large garden, if you take you know, the corn that was growing all the way on the, the end and move it to the next section, maybe you could, you know, potentially uh, mess the insects up so they wouldn't be able to find the corn the next growing season if they were pupating in the soil. Um, choose resistant cultivars. We're going to talk a lot more about this, but again, if your plant is already resistant to a disease, that's one less thing you have to worry about. Planting the plant at the right time. So again, cool season crops like your cauliflower and your broccoli and your brassicas, they don't like to be planted in, in the heat of the summer. So planting them really early in the season when it's nice and cool, they're not going to be as stressed. Also, you may be able to avoid some of those, you know, flying insect pests that um, like the cabbage, the imported cabbage moth, if you plant it early enough in the season, it's too cold for them to be out. So you don't have to worry about, you know, getting that larva, the green worms uh, that can come on some of your brassica plants. Uh, diversify, this can kind of be things like uh, companion planting is one example where you'd plant multiple plants together in one section to try to maybe you know, confuse the insect pest. We're trying this this year for our cucumber beetles. Uh, we planted radishes as well as nasturtium right in the same hole with the cucumber plant uh, to try and see if we can eliminate having cucumber beetle damage. As well as diversifying other crops uh, that don't have as many insect pests. So if you every year you have problems with potato beetles, uh, just don't plant potatoes anymore and that can kind of, you know, eliminate uh, some of your headaches. Remove crop debris, that's a great thing to do. Uh, again, a lot of these insect eggs could live on crop debris or as well as it, um, pests or as well as diseases. So, you know, a lot of the plant diseases that overwinter are usually on crop debris. So by getting rid of that each season, it can give you a leg up. And then also using native plants. Uh, Sherry and I have done a couple talks about um, you know, native plants and how they're more adapted to your specific region. Uh, so that's a great thing to, uh, to do so that you have less stress on your plants. You also have more uh, natural predators because these plants have evolved over time. Uh, so that's a great thing to try. The next IPM uh, control method would be physical. So this would be by using barriers like floating row cover to eliminate pests from actually getting to your crop. You can do traps, uh, physically removing uh, pests like eggs, insect eggs, and things like that. Uh, anything you do to make the environment less suitable uh, to the, the pest or the disease, okay? Let's go on. Uh, the next one is biological control methods. So this is again how natural enemies, predators and parasites um, to pathogens or pests can help you have more tolerable levels. So a lot of people don't even realize how many what we're going to call good bugs there are in the landscape naturally. Uh, so we have to be uh, really mindful of that. Uh, you know we have parasitic wasps that attack things like tomato hornworm, uh, and we have lots of other parasitic wasps that a lot of people think, oh no, wasp, that's a scary word. But a lot of these parasitic wasps are very specific to only attacking one particular pest. Uh, and they're so small that, that you can't even, you can see them, but they're not going to be able to sting humans or anything like that. So by encouraging these natural enemies in your landscape, by providing, you know, some of the habitat that's going to help and you know inspire them to come to your garden uh, that's a great way to have mother nature on your side and to really help help control things let's go to the next one 
please. So how are we going to use biological control methods? Uh, some examples would be predators. So we talked a little bit about some of these good bugs. So insects that feed on what we call the bad bugs or the bugs that we don't want to see uh, necessarily in our landscape. Uh, the parasites, these are going to be ones that live on or inside the host, like the tomato hornworm that I mentioned. And then we have some pathogens, some things like viruses and fungus and bacteria um, and other microorganisms that can cause, you know, other pests to, to die. Um, so there's a virus that sometimes infects gypsy moths uh, that we see a lot of times um, in really wet springs, and that can really help control uh, the, the, the gypsy moth caterpillar population and help keep it in check. All right, what's next? All right, so another way that uh, biological control um, helps to conserve natural enemies would be it, it helps to promote the conditions that really enhance their population. So creating habitat that's favorable for your natural enemies by having different plants in your landscape. So don't plant, you know, an entire garden of just one one variety of tomatoes. So maybe if you, you know, broke it up into three or four different varieties, determinant and indeterminate, so some that are going to bloom early, some that are going to bloom later, um, that can kind of help you uh, to create different, um, you know, op different options for your plants. Uh, and it also can help spread out, you know, if there were to be a pest outbreak, it may not kill every single plant in your planting. And by having not just tomatoes in your vegetable garden, uh, you can help make sure that if you do have a pest outbreak that it's not going to kill every single thing. Okay. Uh, by avoiding uh, pesticides at all, again, sometimes, you know, broad spectrum um, insecticides can wipe out the good and the bad bugs. So you just have to be careful and try to really find one if that is you know, after you tried other means of control, if that's the option you want to go with, then find one that's going to be very specific and follow the label to a T. Okay, chemical control. Again, pesticides are often a very big component of integrated pest management, uh, but they have to be sure that you, you use them properly and that you don't want to use, again, as Sherry said at the beginning, the same pesticide control option every single time you have that pest because you're going to get some things that are um, going to build up immunity to it. So there's two different types of, of pesticides uh, for the chemical control. There's ones that are more conventional. Those would be your insecticides, your herbicides, your fungicides, bactericides, rodenticides, and miticides. And then your more biorationals or reduced risk ones. These would include things like horticultural oil, repellents, and then growth regulators, which are very specific to a particular insect group. Again, I think we've already went over this. Um, choose a pesticide that's very specific to your site and to your problem. Always choose the least toxic option uh, when you can. Uh, and then when available, if you can, you, you can purchase the ready to use products. If you're on a small scale, uh, that's also a great thing to do. You don't have to have any special equipment for mixing um, and things like that. But again, always be sure that you are following whatever the, the label says. Okay, so um, I think I'm going to take over here with the disease management and yes, we'll just get right into that. Um, or Ashley, were you going to talk about the disease triangle? You go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So um, for a disease to happen, you have to have three main components. And that is a good environment for pathogens, the particular plant host that that pathogen needs to uh, survive and reproduce with, and then the um, that particular fungi, bacteria, virus, or nematode. So when you have the plant host, the, the pathogen, and good environmental conditions all occurring at the same time, that's when you get an outbreak in a disease. So that's, that's when a susceptible plant will become infected. 
Here we go. Okay, so some IPM strategies to prevent and reduce disease problems. And we've basically just got a nice little list for you. And uh, I'm not going to spend too much time going over each individual one. Um, if you have more questions, maybe we can talk about that at the end. But it's important to mulch your plants to cover that soil. Uh, it keeps disease, fungal spores, and bacteria from splashing up on your plants. Uh, avoid overhead watering and uh, water in the morning that gives your plant a time a time to dry out so that it's not so moist and humid uh, which remember moist conditions wet conditions favor disease keep your plants healthy that means you want to have healthy soil so you should be adding an inch of uh, compost or some kind of organic material every year use an appropriate amount of fertilizer not too much and not too little neither one is good Put the right plant in the right place. So if you have shade loving plants, make sure you put them in the shade, not in full sun. So do a little research on your plants. Make sure they're getting the appropriate amount of, of sun and water for uh, their particular needs. And maintain a proper moisture level for your plant. Okay, you're also gonna want to monitor frequently for early detection. The sooner you detect a problem, the, the better a chance you're gonna have at getting it under control. Uh, and one thing I wanted to say about this with disease, and you may find this a little bit disheartening, but um, when you notice that your plants are having a disease problem and it's, you know, a large portion of your plant is already, you know, it's got the, the symptoms of a disease, at that point, it's really too late for you to save the plant. You're best just cutting off the disease parts. Um, because most of the fungicides that are out there for homeowners are preventative in nature, not curative. So keep that in mind. Okay, another thing you ought to do is make sure you got your plant space properly so that you have good air circulation in between plants when they're overcrowded. Uh, you have humid, moist conditions. You want to avoid working with plants when they are wet. Some diseases are easily transferred from one plant to another when you're working with them and they're wet. Make sure you prune off the dead and diseased parts. Don't put it in the compost unless you're really good at composting and you get that compost pile up to like 140 degrees for several days and then you'll be sure to kill those fungi and, and disease pathogens. Otherwise, just um, put those diseased plant parts in the trash. Rotate crops, I actually talked about that. Remove dead plant material at the end of the season. Dead plant material can harbor um, various stages of pest insects, whether it be eggs or larvae or pupa or adults. And it can also harbor fungal spores and bacteria and viruses. So you want to get rid of that plant material in the fall so that it's not a source of problem for you uh, in springtime. Okay, you need to also control weeds to remove the favorable habitat for disease carrying insects. And where possible, use disease resistant fruit and vegetable and uh, you know, flower, other plant varieties. So uh, if you are monitoring your plants and you notice that you have a problem with uh, verticillium wilt in your tomatoes, then next year you might wanna try and get a variety of tomato that is resistant to verticillium wilt. Okay, fungicides for vegetables. If you choose to use fungicides, always follow the directions on the label. The label's the law. Whoops, okay. Um, and there are several protectant fungicides out there that are easily accessible to uh, homeowners. You could find these at places uh, at your local nurseries or someplace like Lowe's or Tractor Supply or uh, Southern States, et cetera. You can also order things online. but some of these um, fungicides, I'm gonna read these names to you. Now these names are, I'm telling you the common name for the chemical, okay? So it, um, pesticide labels can be a little bit confusing. There's a lot of information going on there. You've got the brand name, and then you've got the active ingredient name, and then you've got a chemical name, 
And so I think it can be confusing if you're not used to looking at the labels. So these, these words I'm gonna read are the actual active ingredients that you're gonna look for on the label, not the brand names, okay? So Maneb, Mancozeb, Chlorothalonil, and Pyroclostrobin. Now you see in parentheses, I've got the name Pristine next to Pyroclostrobin. So Pristine is actually the brand name, okay? All right, and these are not uh, organic uh, chemicals. Now the next line are a reduced risk uh, chemicals or some of them are even considered organic. And that would be fixed copper, sulfur, lime sulfur, hydrogen peroxide. Now the brand name for the hydrogen peroxide would be Oxidate and you can order that online. Okay, so in order for protective fungicides to work, you need to begin spraying your plants, you know, within a couple weeks of putting them into the ground. And you need to follow the label and continue to spray probably, uh, usually it says every two to three weeks. Um, and you need to keep that up through the season to help prevent disease issues. And also it's important Okay, so Ashley, <clears throat> you talked about early Yes, okay. We're having some technical difficulties, I think, there. Sherry, we lost you for a second, um, but hopefully everyone can hear us now. I was just finishing typing here in the chat that the protectant fungicides only work if used before the disease appears. But right, yes. thank you. Okay, sorry about that. No, it's, you're good. Okay, so we're gonna start with uh, one particular disease that we see uh, usually on tomatoes. Um, and it's something called early blight. Uh, you know, in our, in our positions with extension, I've found over the years that a lot of people use the word blight you know I say my garden has the blight or my plant has the blight uh, so that can really be a misleading term I've found uh, usually I think people use the word blight to just to, to, to reference anything that means their plant doesn't look the way they think it should so anyway early blight is a fungal disease it's alternaria solani uh, and it's very common we see it almost every year on tomato plants and it can cause uh, defoliation it can also uh, pretty much wipe out your entire crop if you don't uh, take good care of it now it doesn't happen overnight but um, it definitely can happen so uh, this, this fungus can overwinter in the soil, it can overwinter in plant debris, it can overwinter on tomato steaks, whether those are, you know, plastic, wooden, um, metal, uh, anything like that. If you're reusing, you know, like landscape fabric or something like that in your garden from season to season, it potentially could overwinter there. Uh, the spores could. Uh, traditionally, we see it uh, forming on the lower leaves of the, the plant first. Uh, so that's a good reason why you want to mulch your plants. If you can create a layer uh, between the, the bottom leaves of your tomato plants and that soil so that whenever it rains or whenever you water, it doesn't get that fungus splashed up and started onto your plant. And it loves moist conditions. So early spring here in Garrett County tends to have a good bit of precipitation where we are. Uh, so we tend to see um, this happening quite a lot. So what are the symptoms? Uh, the first thing you're going to begin to see are small brown spots and it's going to again start on the lower leaves, the oldest leaves that you have on there, and they're going to quickly enlarge. Uh, the characteristic sign that I always look for is a yellow halo that surrounds that brown lesion and then eventually that brown spot is going to turn into something that looks like a bullseye. Uh, so that's kind of um, something that you want to be on the lookout for. Um, let's see, let's go on to the next um, slide, Sherry. See if we have some pictures of this. So as the lesions enlarge, um, you know, they're gonna die. Sometimes they can, you know, look really dark brown. Uh, sometimes they can actually fall out, the centers can. Uh, but you wanna really be uh, mindful of that bullseye lesion so it looks very circular. And then nine times out of 10, what I've seen is you do have the yellow uh, forming around the, 
the brown lesion. So as I said, let's go on to the next slide if you don't mind. Um, the way that we prevent this disease is either with a protective fungicide uh, to make sure that, you know, if there are any of these fungal spores out and about, uh, that it doesn't land on your plant, or if it does land on your plant and it's protected with the fungicide, it cannot infect the plant. This is advanced symptoms of early blight. Again, starts at the bottom. You can take, if you find that you have this disease early in the season and you don't want to use a fungicide, you can take those bottom leaves off as soon as you start to see it and get them out of your garden. Get them out, get them out, get them out. Um, so go ahead and take those bottom leaves off. Um, it can infect the fruit if left unchecked. Uh, the other problem that we see is that uh, once it infects the leaves, as it moves up the canopy, the fruit is often exposed to too much sun. Uh, so we see some sun scald and we see that our fruit doesn't always ripen correctly. Uh, so control is really um, going to be your friend, your control tactics of what are you going to do. Um, again, this, this disease can be managed if you do see it. Um, the best way to manage it is if you can plant some disease resistant cultivars or varieties. Uh, they're coming up with more and more of them all the time. Keep your plants mulched. Again, create a layer between the soil and those first couple sets of leaves so that whenever you water, um, which you should be watering in the morning, not the evening, uh, so your plant has all the time to absorb the water and to get the, the leaves dried off. Um, if you re are reusing tomato steaks or anything like that from year to year, make sure that you're treating them with a one part uh, chlorine solution and nine parts water. Uh, soak your stuff in there, your tomato steaks or whatever it may be, uh, to be ensured that there's no spores overwintering uh, from season to season. Uh, good spacing between your plants. So, you know, 18 to 24 inches is probably not too much, especially if you have really vigorous growing plants. Remove suckers, suckers to increase the airflow within your plant canopy. Again, a lot of people tend to not always want to sucker their plants, but it is really good uh, for the plant because it can help, again, increase that airflow. And then uh, use fungicides. So some options would be fixed copper on the organic side, calanthanil and mancozeb. Those would be active ingredients. Again, as Sherry was saying, um, different brands, you can purchase these active ingredients under. And you can uh, compost uh, any infected plant debris, uh, but again, you need to make sure that you are getting it hot. Uh, so if you don't have a hot compost pile, I recommend just putting it into uh, a black trash bag and letting it bake in the hot sun for a week or so. That's going to be insurance that everything, all the spores are dead because it's too hot and it's too dry in there for anything to, to overwinter. After that, you can put it into your compost pile. Okay, Ashley. Yeah. Okay, I will uh, carry on with talking about late blight. Now, this is not one that we see every year, but we did have this real bad on the East Coast. I, I think it was 2008 or 2009. But this is a fungal disease, and it's a kind of water mold, and it attacks potatoes and tomatoes, which are members of the solanaceous family. So it, this particular disease was responsible for the Irish potato famine in the 1840s. It is very devastating. It's spread by infected potato tubers, volunteer plants from unharvested diseased potatoes, infected tomato transplants, or living tomato or potato plant tissue in compost piles. So when your plants get this disease, uh, it produces a lot of spores, millions of spores, which are then carried by the wind or by rain, and uh, it can travel long distances. The spores can also wash down through the soil to infect potato tubers. And, uh, but it does require living tissue in order for it to survive over winter. It does not survive in the soil at least not the um, strains that we have here in Maryland. Okay, and so it can affect all parts of your plant, stem, leaves, fruit, and uh, the way this appears is you'll see some brown, small brown or olive colored lesions, 
uh, on your stems and they may look kind of water soaked. You might see it on your leaves. Those spots enlarge under cool wet conditions and then you can actually see a little white mold that um, appears at the, the margins of those lesions. And eventually all those little brown lesions coalesce and you get entire leaves and stems, you know, browning and shriveling and almost it looks like it's been burnt. And this happens rapidly. I mean, within 14 days of you seeing the symptoms, your plants will probably be dead. So what it looks like on the fruits is uh, they will develop a shiny, dark or olive colored lesion. Uh, it might be, uh, it might cover a large area, it might just be kind of small, uh, it, but it does invite other kinds of uh, disease issues to come in like rots. Now with potatoes, uh, the way they will look is they will have a shallow brownish or purplish, purplish lesions on the surface. And if you open up the tuber, it's gonna be corky and reddish or brown and look like it's rotten. So tubers might be symptomless at the beginning, but if you try to bring them inside and store them over winter, um, you will definitely see the symptoms of this in storage and it can then spread to the rest of your potatoes and, and ruin all the rest of the potatoes. So uh, these are pictures of what uh, the symptoms look like. If you look at the bottom left hand corner, it's a nice picture of the symptoms on a tomato leaf and you can see, you can actually see some of the white fuzz on there. The uh, fungus has started to sporulate there and so you've got these dark regions that almost look burnt and if you look at this picture in the upper right hand corner yes this is actually at my house and I like to tell people I you know I got late blight just for you all so I could take these nice pictures of diseased plants but uh, it was uh, really devastating it killed all of my tomato plants rather quickly and you can see the um, the oliver brown colored lesions on the stems as well as the leaves are all brown and curled up and then the, the tomatoes um, were looking pretty gnarly there too. Okay, so here's a nice close-up of um, what late blight lesions look like on a green tomato. Okay, and this is just another parting shot of uh, how devastating this uh, disease can be. Okay, and on potatoes, this is a nice picture. You can see that corky rot on the inside and even some of the, the white uh, fungal mycelia growing on the potato. Okay, so what should you do if your plants become infected with this disease? Now, because this is so uh, devastating and travel so easily, we tell people, you know, for the sake of your neighbor and other uh, farmers or producers in the area, you should just immediately pull up these plants. You will not be able to save them. So pull them up and put them in black garbage bags like uh, Ashley talked about and put them, you know, seal them up and then put them in the hot sun for days. It will bake them, cook them in there and then take them to, to the dump. Don't put it in your compost. So what can you do to prevent problems with late blight? Well, you could try to plant some uh, disease resistant varieties, varieties that are resistant to late blight. And for potatoes, uh, that would be Elba and Defender. I do believe they are working on some genetically modified potatoes that are also resistant. Some tomatoes that are resistant to late blight are Mountain Magic, Legend, Iron Lady, Fantasio, Defiant, Plum Regal, and then we have actually have some um, some heirloom tomatoes that are resistant, and that would be Mr. Stripey, Matt's Wild Cherry, and Lemon Drop. Uh, another thing you can do to help prevent late blight would be to buy uh, seed potatoes that are certified disease-free. You could start your own tomato plants from seed or buy locally grown ones rather than buying plugs from a large uh, box store. That's how that um, outbreak started in 2008 or nine. Um, it started in some large greenhouses in the south. Uh, they sent infected tomato transplants uh, to box stores throughout the East Coast. And then, you know, homeowners came and bought them and put them in their gardens. And that's how we got this uh, tremendous spread of the disease all throughout the, uh, the East Coast. So 
uh, you can avoid that by growing your own or buying locally. Uh, destroy all volunteer plants. Like, so if you have, if you missed harvesting a diseased potato from last year and it sends up a shoot the following spring, you'll want to dig that up and put it in the garbage because it can, you know, uh, start the, the whole disease cycle could start from that volunteer potato. Also, um, you want to make sure that the tomatoes and potatoes are not able to, to live in your compost pile because the disease does continue to live on uh, tissue that is alive. It's unlikely that it would live on tomatoes through the winter, but it's possible it could live on, on a potato. And also you want to use protectant fungicides. Okay, Ashley, I'm going to let you talk about powdery mildew. Okay, so powdery mildew is one that we see across ornamentals to vegetable gardening to a lot of different uh, plants. So uh, the one thing I did want to say is that uh, powdery mildew uh, strains are very specific to whatever plant they're on. So if you see it on your peas or on your muskmelon, um, it can't jump over to your tomatoes. Um, likewise, if you see it on your, in your landscape on um, like your phlox or your uh, lilac bushes, that can't jump over to your vegetable garden. So even though it looks the same, um, it's what they call a cosmopolitan pathogen. Uh, so it has to be very specific to its host in order to infect and make it sick. So um, it is a fungus. Uh, it looks just like somebody took a can of baby powder and sprinkled it on top of your plants. Uh, sometimes it happens very quickly. Um, the most common things that we see it infecting in our vegetable garden would be squash um, or pumpkins. We see it almost every year on them. Uh, there are some varieties that are supposed to be more resistant, uh, so that's something you can look for. Uh, and the fungus, it does overwinter as spores on fallen leaves. So again, the sanitation is very important, getting anything that's dead out of your garden uh, at the end of the season. And also sometimes it can be dormant in different buds on your ornamental plants. So again, infection starts when plants are mature and it's rarely, it's rarely super severe, uh, but sometimes it can be devastating. Let's go to the next slide, please. So again, the first symptoms that you see is that uh, your plants are going to not look nearly as bright green. Um, it's going to look very much just like, again, kind of like a fungus, just a, a white covering that starts to, to cover your plants. Um, it, again, it's, it's a fungus, so it spreads by spores uh, that are released from the surface layer of the mycelium. And then it can be carried by leaves, by the, you know, carried to the leaves by air current. Um, it can be splashed, I think, by rain uh, once it gets uh, infected on your plant. Uh, here are some pictures um, of it on a squash, a winter squash plant. Uh, so if you've done much vegetable gardening, uh, unfortunately, you probably have seen this uh, earlier in the chat. Somebody was saying that uh, they saw it on uh, one of their landscape plants um, already this season. Uh, so it's just very devastating and one of the ways that it uh, causes issues with the plant is that whenever the fungus is blocking the plant leaf surface, the plant cannot photosynthesize so therefore it cannot be efficient and it cannot grow as well. So that's why we tend to see, um, you know, problems happening in our plants is because it's blocking that plant's ability to photosynthesize. So this is a close up. Again, it's going to look just like somebody put powder. Um, if you look at the underneath side, sometimes it's not really as infected as the top of the leaves. We tend to see it more on the top. Um, once you've seen this, you probably will never forget what it looks like. Uh, we see it on, a lot, again, a lot of ornamentals as well as uh, vegetable plants. I think the next slide should tell us a little bit about how to manage it. Oh, here is a picture of it on a pumpkin stem. So again, it can infect every part of the plant, not just the leaves, uh, the stems, the fruit. Um, it, it really stresses the plant out. So the management strategies would be to, again, select resistant cultivars, plant in full sun, especially if that plant needs the full sun, which most all vegetables do. 
water plants early in the day to, to allow the foliage to dry out so that you won't have, you know, excess time for this uh, fungal spores to land on the leaves and infect the plant. Monitor and catch infection early. Um, again, if it's just is starting on a few of the leaves, you can go ahead and prune those off, uh, get them out of the landscape, and then you could use uh, something like horticultural oil or neem oil to try to limit its, um, its how bad it gets in your garden, I guess. Okay, that's powdery mildew. Uh, again, it tends to like a lot of the environments that we have, so it likes hot weather um, and things like that. Uh, the next disease we wanted to talk about is bacterial wilt, and this would be in the cucurbits, so uh, mainly cucumbers we see it in, but it can also be like in squash and that sort of thing. Uh, so bacterial wilt is a disease that is transmitted uh, primarily, or only I guess, by uh, the striped cucumber beetle. So what happens is this cucumber beetle has this uh, bacteria in its stomach, and then whenever it defecates on the leaves where it's eating, uh, it opens a wound on the leaf and then this bacteria can get into the plant. Uh, and it's very devastating uh, for plants. And just like the name says, it causes wilting of the stems, leaves, and then the entire plant. And a lot of times you'll see death within a week, um, week to 10 days, maybe two weeks, but it usually happens very quickly. And because it's a bacteria, if you were to take a piece of stem and put it into a glass of warm water uh, and kind of pull it apart, you would see this sappy, uh, milky color discoloration coming out of it. But most people, uh, the physical uh, attributes of this disease when it's completely wilted to the ground um, very quickly, it's a pretty good indication that's what it is. So again, I said that it happens in the striped cucumber beetle. It happens it overwinters in the gut. So these uh, cucumber beetles, they overwinter as adults in crop debris or right at the soil surface um, in gardens or protected areas. So that's how it goes from season to season. Stays in, in the beetle's gut. And once the adult wakes back up in the spring of the year, it's gonna start feeding, it's gonna mate. Uh, and that's how it goes from season to season. Here are some pictures. This looks like a squash. Um, you can see how it just, permanent wilting, watering is not going to make it come back um, or anything like that because it is a bacteria and it's infecting the whole entire plant system. Do we have any other things? So the control for it would be that uh, you would want to, again, try resistant varieties, but not only resistant to the wilt, but resistant to the cucumber beetle feeding. Uh, the other thing is to control the beetle itself. If you don't have the cucumber beetle present, there's no way that your plant can get this disease. Uh, so one way to do that would be, again, you can look at these disease resistant cultivars. County Fair uh, is resistant to bacterial wilt. And then Gemini, Little Leaf 19, and Saladan are supposed to be resistant to cucumber feeding. You can also use the floating row cover, that physical exclusion. Uh, unfortunately, with the cucurbit family, they need to have cross-pollination by insects, so you can't leave the floating row cover on there the whole entire season. Uh, you have to take it off once the flowers start to open and you start to get blooms if you want to get a good fruit set. Uh, some options for controlling the beetles when you first start to see them would be pyrethrum, neem, and pyganic. And again, by removing the weeds and debris around your garden at the end of the season, uh, you can really help to control, again, kill the places or get rid of the habitat where these beetles could overwinter so that you won't have them the next season. Okay, so I guess I will take over with gray mold. Uh, this is caused by a fungus called Botrytis cinerea. And it is a widespread fungus that affects most vegetables and fruit crops, as well as large numbers of shrubs, flowers, and trees. And it does manifest differently, at, like different patterns on leaves, uh, depending on the species it's on. But in general, uh, it's got this, it's a dark uh, lesion and has fuzzy whitish gray mold growing on the surface in infected areas. And you can see that when it's uh, humid 
it's favored by cool, moist conditions like in between 60 and 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Losses for uh, commercial growers can be pretty severe uh, if you have long periods of overcast skies or uh, rain. But primarily it causes blossom blights and fruit rots. It can also cause damping off, bud rot, bulb rot, stem cankers, etc. And it does overwinter in the soil on plant debris. So this is a picture of what it looks like on strawberries. And it's that gray fuzzy stuff that you might have seen sometime in your own refrigerator. Okay, um, surprise, you open up your leftovers, you think you're gonna have something nice and you see some kind of fuzzy stuff growing in there. So it's like that. And uh, the ways that you can uh, kind of avoid having a botrytis problem in your landscape is to, if you can, uh, avoid growing in heavy clay soils. I live in Garrett County, Maryland, which that's not really possible unless you have a raised bed or you're growing in pots. Uh, you want to avoid overcrowding your plants so that you have good air circulation. That's very important. Don't plant your crown, the crowns of your plants too deeply. Over fertilization can encourage overhead watering can also encourage your plants are period of time. So uh, if you see disease in your your garden, you'll want to remove diseased plant parts as soon as you can. And you want to you'll want to use protectant fungicides and um, you want to do that probably as soon as possible. And fungicides should be used with caution though because the gray mold pathogen can develop a, a fungicide tolerance. So you'll definitely, with this one, you'll want to alternate fungicides with different modes of action, such as thyram, captan, and chlorothalonil. So anthra <clears throat> excuse me, anthracnose on vegetables, um, there are many different species of anthracnose and they will affect different vegetables, including peppers and beans, tomato, eggplant, cucumber, muskmelon, watermelon, pumpkin, spinach, and peas. And the way this appears on your affected fruit would be uh, black lesions, that, like they're sunken, and you might actually see a pinkish or salmon colored spores uh, around or in the, in the lesion or around the lesion. This fungus does overwinter in seeds, in soil, and also in plant residues. So you wanna have good sanitation at the end of the growing season. Wet weather does promote this disease development, but uh, it's over a wide range of temperatures, anywhere from 55 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And here we have some photos of what that looks like on leaves and fruit. And you can see it does look slightly different um, from one species to another. So but you do see that the dark sunken lesions, it's especially evident on fruit. Um, leaves, it just kind of looks like uh, dark, dark coalescing areas. Okay, so it, it's important in order to help um, stave off this disease to make sure you have mulch around your plant so it keeps the spores from splashing up onto your plants when it rains or when you water. Pick your fruits regularly and don't let rotten fruit stay on your plants because that's just gonna be a source of spores that are gonna spread to your other plants. Quickly remove those inf infected fruits and avoid contact between the soil and your fruit if possible. In the one picture with the strawberries, you saw that it was growing uh, in black plastic. So that does help. But if the plastic isn't tight and you have little dips in the plastic, you're gonna get pools of water forming. And if the fruit's laying in those pools of water, that's not helpful either. So keep an eye out for that. Avoid overhead watering during uh, humid cloudy weather and good sanitation as we already discussed and begin fungicide when the fruits are forming. Okay, Ashley, I'm gonna let you jump in on damping off. So damping off is a disease that we see 
uh, a lot of times if you're starting your own uh, seedlings early in the, the spring of the year. Uh, so what you see is that your plants look beautiful one day and you go back out the next day and they've completely just kind of slothed over. Uh, so it's caused by several different types of problems. It could be pythium, which is a fungus, phytophthora, which is a fungus, sclerotinia, which is a mold, or botrytis, which is a mold. Um, so usually we, what we don't see is, is um, the problem is right at the soil line or just below the soil line. Uh, and again, it's whenever your plants look really, really great one day and then you go back, you know, a couple hours later sometimes and these molds or these funguses have kind of gotten into the, the xylem and phloem, the, the different um, mechanisms of how, you know, plants get water up to the leaves and how they get sugars back down to the roots. Um, and it kind of clogs up those, those pathways. And then we end up with the plants just slumping over. Um, so these are some really good pictures. Um, again, you can see a healthy one. If you look all the way on the right hand side, what it should look like is healthy with the roots and then uh, the brown part where the, the fungus or the, uh, the pathogen has infected the plant. So uh, the next slide is going to tell us how to manage it. Uh, and this is one that um, you, you really, you have a couple of options, but the main way that you're going to manage this disease is through cultural control. So how you can manage your, your seedlings a little bit more efficiently. Uh, so the first thing to do is to always have a sterile potting mix when you're starting your seeds. Uh, start with clean pots. If you're reusing containers from season to season, make sure you have a 10% bleach solution and let it soak for at least 10 minutes before you reuse them. Don't put the plants too deep. Your seeds, obviously, um, you know, the seed packet will tell you the exact depth that you want your plants to be seeded at. Uh, the, the worst problem that you can, that you can have is to overwater uh, these seedlings. That tends to really encourage this, these diseases to happen. Um, the number one thing that I've found to make this less of a problem in my greenhouse is that I just add a fan. Um, the fan can help you if you water too much. It helps keep the soil dried out almost daily. Um, the only thing I've used is a misting bottle and not like a watering can to ensure that you're not getting too much water on these uh, fragile seedlings. And then of course adequate heat and light. So uh, by having a germination mat, if you have a heat mat uh, to get your soil the proper temperature that gets your seedlings up and growing more robustly and more quickly. So they're not just sitting there, um, you know, with, with more problems potentially to infect uh, the diseases. Okay. Okay. So uh, thank you, Ashley. We're gonna move on to talking about uh, insect pest management. And the first thing we're gonna start with is some a list of you know tips you know that you can do in your own yard to help reduce problem with insect pests and then we're going to show you some pictures of some beneficial insects so you'll know which ones are the good guys and then we'll show you some of the pests so that you can correctly identify the insects in your yard so you know whether or not an insect uh, is beneficial or a problem so some IPM strategies that you'll want to incorporate in your landscape to help prevent and reduce insect problems are keep your plants healthy and we already went through this with the disease issues. Uh, healthier plants are better able to uh, recover from insect predation and also better able to uh, ward off disease bacteria and, and uh, fungi. You'll want to monitor your plants frequently for early detection uh, so that you can head off a big problem uh, as soon as possible. The longer you let a problem go, the harder it is to save your plant. Remove eggs and insects by hand. If you monitor your plants and you can find eggs on your plants <clears throat> and you can remove those immediately you are saving yourself a world of trouble because once those eggs hatch and they start moving around uh, you know it's larva or nymphs or whatever it is uh, it's going to be a lot harder to control so removing eggs is one of the best control strategies that you can incorporate you can rotate crops and uh, good sanitation is important 
You want to control the weeds to remove favorable habitat for pest insects. You can encourage beneficial insects, natural predators, and parasites uh, by creating a habitat within your yard that is favorable to them. And you want to reduce your use of pesticides, and that will also help encourage uh, beneficial insects. Remove infested plant parts as soon as possible so that um, it doesn't spread to your other plants. You can use barriers such as row covers. I do this with, uh, with broccoli and kale and um, collards. The things that I would get uh, cabbage loopers on is cabbage butterflies because once those caterpillars go on, get on there, they will you know, devour your plants. And those plants don't need a pollinator. So as soon as you plant them, you can cover them with row cover and light and water is able to get through to your plants and it keeps out those pests and you don't have to use fungi or you don't have to use pesticides. You can change the timing of your planting in order to circumvent a pest life cycle. If you have a particular problem with cucumber beetles, um, it's a good idea to delay the planting of your cucumbers or squash or melons and they will, you know, you wait for that pest insect to emerge out of the, the soil and they mature and move off and it will help, well they will come back, but those young ones, the young larvae won't be able to get into your, your plants and um, feed on the roots and, and weaken your plants. So if you do delay the planting of your cucurbits, uh, cucurbits, it will help with that problem. You can plant trap crops. Uh, radishes are a good trap crop for flea beetles if you have a problem with flea beetles because uh, your radishes will do fine if the flea beetles eat those leaves, but it'll help uh, kind of get them away from your, the plants that they, you don't want them to do damage on. And also you can try and find pest resistant varieties. Okay, so there are some reduced risk insecticides out there that you can use that I find are very, um, very effective. And that is especially for caterpillars. I find uh, BT is, works really well and also Spinazad. Now these are um, bacteria that are very specific to the, uh, the pest that you're trying to control, especially Bt. Bt only kills um, moth and butterfly larva and they have to be feeding on the plant that you have applied this Bt to, okay? The, the caterpillar ingests it and then it paralyzes their gut and they, they die. Now with Spinazad, this is a bacteria that was discovered in a rum distillery in, uh, in the Caribbean and it's, had, it's, it's really effective. It does uh, control a wider range of insects, but it's only in the, the larval stage. So it, it controls caterpillars uh, and the larvae of flies and beetles and as well as thrips. So um, that's, a, that's a really good one to use. And the other reduced risk insecticides out there are horticultural oil, neem oil. Uh, horticultural oil works by actually smothering the insect. So you have to contact the insect with this and insects breathe through their exoskeleton. So when you cover them with oil, they can't breathe and they die. The neem oil, works by, by two different modes. The oil itself also smothers the insect, but the neem uh, has a chemical in it called azadirectin, and that actually repels insects, but it, do, it, it does have to be ingested in order for it to, um, to kill. Insecticidal soap is another reduced risk um, thing that you can use, and it works by actually drying out the, uh, the insects. It causes uh, desiccation of the insects and that works by contact. Okay, Ashley's gonna 
talk to us, or actually I'm going to talk to us about good guys, and then Ashley's got all the bad guys to talk about. Okay, so here are some beneficial insects that I, I hope that you can become familiar with so that you, when you see them in your landscape, you try to encourage them, protect them, and you don't, don't reach for a, a can of Raid and spray them, okay, because they're, they're out there, they're being helpful, they are predators on pest insects such as aphids and white flies, scale other soft-bodied insects, and they will eat the eggs of other um, pest insects as well. So on the left-hand side, you see a ladybug. Uh, in the bottom, it's you see the adult, and above it, you'll see this is what the, the larval stage of the ladybug looks like. So um, both the lacewing and the ladybug have a complete metamorphosis life cycle, which means they go from egg to larva to pupa to adult. So during the uh, larva and adult stage, this insect ladybug is really helpful in devouring all kinds of pest insects and um, the larva can eat one aphid a minute. Now with the lacewing, the adults actually um, don't eat other insects, they eat nectar and pollen, but their larva, which you can see above, um, they are voracious predators and they can eat up to 600 pest insects um, in, in, their, uh, in their life there. So lace wings uh, are great, so you want to encourage them. And then some other beneficial insects that you may find in your yard, if you look on the left-hand side, are surfed flies. Uh, they look like bees, and some people call them um, sweat bees, but they're, they're actually flies. Another name for them is hoverfly or flower fly. And the adult actually just eats pollen and nectar, but its larva, uh, which you can see above, it, it would be a maggot, it, it consumes um, many aphids and other pest insects like uh, the scale, well not the scale, the uh, white flies. And it's, it can eat, um, yeah, it, I was trying to think of how many it eats per minute, but it does eat a lot. It is a one great um, helpful insect. And then over in the right hand corner you see ground beetles. Now they tend to hang around um, your plants at the bottom of your plants. So when pest insects fall off of your plants, they're right there to gobble them up. And ground beetles like um, mulch and especially straw mulch. And so they can be very helpful. And then in the bottom right hand corner you see an assassin bug. And they are also very helpful predators. Okay, and finally I was going to talk about parasitic wasps. They are very helpful in, uh, insects that you can have in your landscape. They're, these Many of these are very small and they, they don't sting people. Uh, but what they do is they insert their eggs inside of uh, pest insects. Like if you look at the um, picture on the upper left hand corner that's a tomato hornworm and you'll see there's all these uh, it looks like tic tacs stuck all over that caterpillar or what that is is it's actually the uh, pupa of a parasitic wasp a parasitic wasp has landed on this uh, unsuspecting tomato hornworm and inserted eggs inside of the body of that hornworm those eggs then hatch and the larvae come out of those eggs and they feed on the innards of this uh, hornworm. And while they're doing that, they put out this hormone that tells the hornworm to keep eating. So that way the larvae are able to continue to develop within the, the hornworm. And then when they're ready to move to the next stage, they burrow out of that hornworm and form that cocoon and then the adult wasp emerges from that cocoon. So if you see that, um, know that the, the parasitic wasps have come to the rescue and they are going to um, help kill this, this caterpillar, although it will keep eating. So you might wanna remove it <laughs> and put it you know, somewhere in your garden uh, so that the eggs, or excuse me, the pupa can 
can continue to develop and uh, allow those wasps to emerge. So it's pretty, some pretty interesting, and then it sometimes gruesome stuff. All right, now Ashley's gonna talk about the bad guys and how to identify them and control them. All right, so the very first one I have to talk about are the cucumber beetles. So we're lucky, we have two different species of cucumber beetles. We have the striped cucumber beetle and then the spotted. Um, so the striped one is um, usually what we see feeding on what usually causes uh, the bacterial wilt that we talked about earlier. Um, but both of these can feed on any type of cucurbits. Again, they prefer cucumbers, so they're rightly named. Um, Sherry, you might have to help me out here. The striped uh, cucumber beetle can also feed on corn. Isn't that correct? Um, actually, the, the spot, I think it's the spotted cucumber beetle. Another name for it is the uh, corn. Corn. And striped cucumber beetle can, of course, feed on corn. But um, the, the striped cucumber beetle is more of a generalist than the striped cucumber beetle. Okay. We are. We are not hearing you very well at all, Sherry. Um, oh. So let's try that again. Tell me the striped cucumber beetle is the corn one or the other way around? I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, uh-huh. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so the spotted cucumber beetle is the corn, the one that it feeds on corn. Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> That's what I thought, but I just wanted to make sure. Um, so yeah, so if you have sweet corn or field corn nearby your garden, um, it can also feed on uh, that crop, and then it can move over to your uh, to your vegetable garden to, to eat your cucumbers. So just uh, be forewarned with that one. So again, uh, we talked about this one a little bit earlier. Uh, it can be very um, ugly to your crops, for lack of better words. Uh, the larva, they actually, uh, lay the eggs and the larva uh, live on the roots and they can actually feed on the roots of your cucumber so you can get damage at the root level. Uh, they can feed on uh, the stems, the leaves, the um, the fruit itself uh, and it causes this like pit, pitting damage. Uh, so once they start chewing on it, uh, again if you have them in heavy infestations uh, that can be quite devastating. Uh, not just because of bacterial wilt but just in general uh, damage, especially on young crops. So um, you, again, you can use the floating row cover uh, to control them early in the season. Uh, we're trying some different types of beneficial or some different types of companion planting to kind of confuse them um, so that they don't infect your crop too, too soon. Let's go to the next one. Uh, so this one is the potato beetle. Uh, so it's very specific to uh, the potato family. Uh, the best time to control it would be um, whenever it's in the larval form, which is on the right hand side, uh, or when it's in the egg form is even better. But handpicking these guys because they are so, so large is a great way to do that. Again, if you have a, a bucket of soapy water, dish soap in your bucket of water, uh, just knock them down into there. That way you don't have to actually physically squish them because uh, that's not always the, the most kind thing or the easiest thing for some people to do. Um, so just get a bucket of water, put a little bit of dish soap in and knock them down in there. Um, hand picking is really early on before you have heavy infestation is the, the easiest way to control these guys. All right, this is my other nemesis. This is squash bugs. So uh, these are true bugs, what we call a true bug, six legs, hard outer shell with wings. Um, and the easiest time to control them, they are, they have incomplete metamorphosis. So they only have three uh, life stages. They go from egg to a nymph to an adult. Uh, controlling them when they're either in the egg form, which is the right hand side or the nymphal form, uh, is your best option. If you wait until they are an adult, there is absolutely no insecticide that I know of that is very effective on them because they are just very hardy when they get to that stage. Uh, so uh, they have these bright red eggs, which make them really easy to see, usually on the underneath side of the leaves. Again, if you can catch them then, uh, squish them or put them in a bucket of soapy water, that'll kill them. Um, again, floating row cover early on, but because your squashes and, and things like that, uh, pumpkins, they need to be pollinated, cross-pollinated. Um, you really have to take that off. 
Next, uh, we also have the Mexican bean beetle. Again, controlling them when they're in this larva form, which is the top right-hand corner, um, or when they're in the egg form is the absolute best time to do it. Again, hand picking. A lot of these uh, bad bugs that we see, you just have to be very vigilant uh, and be scouting your garden almost daily uh, to kind of catch them before uh, they get out of control. They're very squishy, they're very prickly. Um, a lot of people miss um, identify the Mexican bean beetle as a lady bird beetle. Uh, but these are going to be a little bit more yellowish to orange uh, and a little bit bigger generally. Um, and your ladybird beetles will not have a larva that looks anything like this. Next we have aphids. So these little guys are literally, they suck sap. They have a proboscis that they uh, stick into the green tissue of your leaves and um, they inject some chemicals in there so that they can suck um, the juice right out of your plants. Uh, so the next picture I believe shows what uh, the damage generally looks like. Again, underneath side of the leaves it causes this bending twisting. They love new growth. That's their favorite thing. So a lot of times you're going to see this damage on the youngest part where it's most succulent on your plants. Um, you can control them a couple different ways. I, you know, because there's so many good bugs that like to feed on them. We talked about the Searford flies, Sherry did, and also the ladybird beetles. Uh, so I don't tend to like to recommend a whole lot of um, insecticides to control them. Just let the natural enemies move in. If you're seeing really large um, concentrations of them, uh, you can use a heavy spray of water uh, to knock them off, which again, is not gonna kill the, the good bugs, uh, but it can kind of help slow them down. You also get some parasitic wasps that move in uh, that are gonna lay their eggs and you'll get those aphid mummies um, that you see coming on. Uh, the other thing about aphids is that sometimes you'll see ants farming them. So ants want the honeydew, the sweet, uh, stuff that they secrete, their waste. Uh, so ants will actually sometimes take care of an aphid colony. I see this almost every year on the weed um, curly dock. Uh, at the very tip of the top we get black aphids in our garden and we'll see an ant colony that's actually farming or taking care of those those aphids so that they can get the honeydew. So kind of a cool story. Next we have uh, spider mites. So as the name might suggest, these are not insect pests, but they often get grouped into uh, the same um, the same group. Uh, they actually have eight legs instead of six, so that's how you can tell a spider mite from maybe a an aphid or something like that. Uh, and they actually kind of crawl and resemble a spider a little bit more than an insect. So very tiny. We have the two spotted spider mite highlighted there for you. Again, they they cause a lot of what they call um, modeling. So again, they're also sucking the juice right out of your plants and it usually causes a bronzing look, usually on the underneath side. Um, one good test is if you take a white sheet of paper out to your garden and you tap on the plant that you have in question, a lot of times you'll see these little guys fall off and they'll just be crawling around like crazy um, or running around. That's one way to tell that you have spider mites. The other thing you'll see is um, like little webs that come on, just like a spider. Um, they're going to be a lot smaller, but you'll see the webbing um, when really heavy infestations. Uh, there are some, I don't really have good control strategies for them. They're kind of hard. Um, usually, again, populations tend to explode when it's really, really hot, uh, so that if you can, um, you know, kind of keep your plants a little cooler, that might, you know, eliminate them from coming on. And the last one we have is the brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, so this is an invasive, this is a non-native stink bug that was brought here from Asia. Uh, you can tell it apart from our native brown uh, stink bugs because it has the white and black banding around uh, its back end. It also has a white and black band on its antenna. Uh, so these guys are non-native, as I said, so they cannot survive the winters um, on the east, in the east coast, at least not in Maryland. Uh, so the, you know, these are the ones that are trying to get into your home uh, because they can't take the cold. They overwinter anywhere that's protected, so they like to be underneath um, your siding or in 
um, you know, in your attic or something like that, then these are the guys that are um, responsible for that. And they have a proboscis and they can cause some damage to your fruit, but thankfully it hasn't been nearly as bad as it was once predicted. So these are some resources for you. You can contact either Sherry or I at our office, uh, the Home and Garden Information Center. We also have um, the Bug of the Week website which is really quite fun to look at. Uh, the Maryland Grows blog is another great one. They are highlighting beneficial insects this whole entire year. So um, some good resources for you to, to check out. And with that, I think we have a couple polling questions. We thank you all for hanging out with us this evening. We hope that you've um, enjoyed it and that you've learned a few things. We will be sending out um, you know, the handouts and the link to the recording in the next few days. So if you would, uh, please go ahead and uh, answer these four polling questions. Give us your feedback. Let us know what you thought of the class. Uh, I think we've caught, we've stayed pretty up to date on the chat. Sherry, do you have any questions from the chat you want to discuss or anybody that wants to add other questions, we'd be happy to answer them. I think we kept up. So uh, if anybody has any more questions, if you want to put them in the chat box, we'll stick around for a little bit to answer questions. And yeah, I'll also enter uh, all our emails in there one more time in case you want to reach out to either one of us. Uh, in the meantime, with pictures, we if you send us a picture, that really helps us to help identify uh, what the pest or problem may be. We can give you some some feedback that way. A few more minutes. We've only had about 60% of folks have entered our polling questions. There are four of them, so you have to scroll down. Uh, but we do appreciate you taking the time to do that to give us the feedback. We really, we really do help that. Uh, in the chat, we have Kim um, mentioned that it's important to also clean your equipment. And that's, that's, she's very right. We, sh we uh, thank you for mentioning that. It is important to clean your, your trimmers, your clippers in between plants, especially, you know, if the plants are diseased, you definitely want to put them in like a 10% bleach solution or some isopropyl alcohol, something that's gonna kill that, the disease, the fungi or whatever it is uh, between plants. So thank you for bringing that up, Kim. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and end the polling questions. Thank you for everyone that was able to participate. We appreciate that. Um, let's see, do you see any other questions? Uh, something about salt, using salt. Um, yeah, the concoction for, you know, Dawn dish soap, salt, and vinegar for a natural herbicide. I honestly, that oh, okay. makes me leery. I just worry about that because of the permanent damage that the salt could cause um, to your soils. So honestly, I think that, you know, your reduced risk herbicides that you can purchase over the, you know, are a little bit safer because they've been tested and they have the label redirections right there on it. That's my thoughts. Yep, I agree. I, I don't think I'd want to put salt into the soil. Okay. All right. Well, again, we uh, thank you all very much for uh, joining us this evening. And if you have any questions, please feel free to, um, you know, reach out to us. One question, how do you control cabbage worms? Uh, so I think Sherry mentioned it briefly. Uh, she likes to use floating row cover on all the brassicas because they don't need to be pollinated. So the day I transplant my brassicas, I, I put a floating row cover on there. So that's anything from kale to broccoli to cauliflower. They don't need pollinated. And if you can keep the butterfly and the moths out of there, then you're gonna keep the larva, the little green worms out of your plants. So good question. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, something that you could use to spray your plants with would be BT, that works very well, or spinazad, that would also work well for the, those caterpillars. Right, and I think um, the BT, it just has to touch the, the caterpillar and it'll kill them, or they can consume the, the foliage that's already treated and it'll kill them. So both good, yeah. low impact control options, so. 
All right. Well, with that, I think we are going to sign off for the evening. We have a, one more webinar, I believe, two weeks from now on uh, using pesticides safely. So we'll send that link out when we send the, the recording link and um, the handouts from today. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, everyone. And uh, hope to see you again. Thanks for participating.